my lab has been working with uh, brain organoids for a while now, and they recapitulate or they mimic a human development at the molecular level as well as the cellular level. The organization of the cells resemble some of the organizations that we see during development. So in our case, we are focusing on the cortex. As these organoids mature, we can identify different cortical layers being formed. So that was a great and very attractive model to study disorders that affect cell proliferation, uh, gene expression, uh, virtually morphology of the brain. But there are several neurological conditions uh, and psychiatric conditions where the brain is just intact. The problem relies on network. And we have been trying to push this field uh, to create brain organoids that are functional in a way that they can create sophisticated uh, networks. That was um, the original motivation to optimize this novel protocol so the networks can be formed. So we have been measuring the activity of uh, neuronal networks by uh, using multi-electrode arrays or MEAs. To be honest, I was not expecting them to increase too much over time. After about four to six months of culturing these organoids, Priscilla and Kleber from my lab, they came to me and said, we have a big surprise. The whole well was synchronized and there was like a lot of activity going on and we've never seen that in 2D. We were never able to see so high levels of activity, so we were just very surprised. Uh, this was unprecedented in tissue culture and uh, initially my reaction was to be very skeptical. So I thought that there was um, a short circuitry or, or a bug into the system that was generating these spikes from the multi electrode arrays. So it was um, a very unexpected result. So that's what motivated us to further investigate uh, what was going on. To generate the cortical organoids, we dissociate the iPSC colonies into single cells, and we keep these cells in suspension under rotation to form free-floating spheres. We promote the neural induction by dual SMAD inhibition, and for the proliferation of neuroprogenitor cells, we add growth factors into the media, such as FGF and EGF. Then we remove these growth factors and we add some small molecules to promote the neural differentiation and maturation. However, these small molecules, they are kept only for a short period of time and the long-term maintenance of the organoids occurs in a more basal media. We turn to a single cell analysis to see if the diversity of uh, the cellular populations were actually contributing uh, to this uh, level of activity. To characterize the cellular diversity of cortical organoids during development, we perform single cell RNA-seq on 1, 3, 6, and 10 months organoids. We use unsupervised clustering on the combined data set with almost 20,000 cells to identify clusters and their relative proportions. Based on the expression of genes, we combine them into five major cell classes. Progenitors, intermediated progenitors, glial cells, glutamatergic neurons, and GABAergic neurons. At one month, organoids consist of more than 70% of progenitor cells. At three and six months, cortical organoids consist of glia and glutamatergic neurons. The glia cells start with a small population and increase to around 40% of cells present in the cortical organoids. Remaining population of progenitors, around 5%, and intermediated progenitors, around 10%, were present during maturation. Gabergic neurons were mainly restricted to 6 to 10 months, as indicated by the expression of specific markers, eventually reaching around 15% of total neuronal population. To further demonstrate the biosynthesis of GABA, we employ mass spectrometry. The neurotransmitter GABA was detected in the culture media after 6 months of maturation in a physiological relevant concentration. These results suggest the presence of the basic components for the generation of a neural network in a developing human cortical model. So by growing these organoids, uh, by giving them the right environment, we can um, stimulate the uh, progenitor cells to produce a more diverse type of cell populations.
To interrogate the functional activity of these cortical organoids, we start at the single cell level using patch clamp in individual neurons. And we observed repetitive action potential firing in response to current injection. This action potential firing and also voltage dependent sodium current, they were abolished in the presence of TTX. Then we decided to challenge the organoid and see if we could modulate the neuronal activity. And in the presence of glutamate receptor antagonists, the postsynaptic current was also abolished, confirming that we had functional excitatory neurons in the organoid. The variability between replicates in the organoids was very low compared to 2D cultures, which is also really important for research. Then we decided to do an investigation in a more mesoscopic scale, and we performed weekly recordings using a multi-electrode array over the course of 10 months. In this approach, we were able to collect single channel and population firing features from time-wise spike times and the local field potential. And in this case, the spikes, they represent multi-unit activity due to the spatial and temporal resolution of DMA, which is not sufficient for single unit detection. We could clearly see an increasing activity. This activity was very robust, switching from periods of quiescence and burst synchronized network spikes. And the increase of these network bursts was not only in number, but also in complexity, reflecting the maturation of the organoids. We further evaluated the role of glutamatergic and GABAergic synaptic transmission in forming oscillations by pharmacological intervention. Neural networks were affected by both glutamate receptor antagonists and GABA receptor agonists. These drugs reduced the number of spikes and bursts with a subsequent elimination of synchronous activity. The blockage of GABAergic transmission by bicuculin increased the number of network synchronized events and did not affect peak population firing rate, but abolished nested oscillatory activity by raising subsequent peaks. In other words, glutamatergic signaling is important for starting oscillatory activity, while GABA is important for keeping them going. The other thing that we decided to investigate was if we have that much activity, it is possible that these networks will generate uh, brain waves similar to the ones captured by EEGs. So that's when we turned uh, our collaborators uh, in the uh, Wojtek lab. This is Brad Wojtek at uh, Cognitive Neurosciences here at UCSCG. In the Wojtek lab, we look at a lot of human electrophysiology, so signals like EEG, ECOG, and MEG. And the reason why these oscillating organoids are interesting is because Oscillations are a ubiquitous feature in animals as well as humans. You'll see an alpha oscillation at 10 hertz. So that's why we think the organoids that are oscillating are special. There wasn't any 2D culture or other organoid work that was showing oscillating cultures. So what you're seeing in these traces are the total number of neurons that are firing at that time. A higher peak means there are more neurons or more action potentials that are emitted. At six weeks, the neurons don't really synchronize. They fire sparsely and randomly. Starting at two months, they start to synchronize in these burst events. They have these periods where all the neurons in the network activate at the same time. Then it just decays slowly. Starting at four months, they spike really quickly once, and then they spike again within a couple hundred milliseconds. So that's what we call an oscillation. And then at six months, there are more and more cycles in this oscillation. It's very regular you see the same oscillation. But eight months, the trajectories become less stereotypical. We don't only see oscillation at a single time scale. Um, there are multiple frequencies that are nested in each other. But the slowest scale, these bursts happen every 10 to 20 seconds, and it's fairly regular. Um, but within a single burst, you see this oscillation at the second scale, which is what we call the nested oscillation. And then there's even a faster oscillation at 100 hertz that's nested within that one. 
So this nestedness um, or cross-frequency coupling is another feature that we see in human as well as an animal electrophysiology. So the transition be from six to eight months in the functional activity we think is a product of a more complex physical network in the organoid. As we saw in the anatomical data, there are more GABAergic neurons as well as more glial cells that grow in this time span. So that's one possibility for how these organoids at eight months are able to have these more complex activities. More importantly, they were able to compare the EEG from preterm babies at different stages in development to our brain organoids. After seeing these organoids starting to exhibit these more complex electrical features, we thought maybe we can compare it to EEG data from very early development. So we were able to find this clinical data set actually of preterm uh, infant EEG data. And so this regression model is basically saying if we just trained a very simple machine learning model on the baby's EEG features to predict how old the babies are, can we then use that to predict directly using the organoids features how old the organoids are in culture time? So the regression model was trained on data from 25 to 38 weeks. The preterm EEGs are wildly different from the organoid MEAs. In the EEG signal, the summation of a lot of brain areas on the other side of the skull, which also smears the electrical signal. Um, in the organoid MEA, the electrodes are directly in contact with the organoids. So you can pick up action potentials as well as local field potentials at a much better resolution. That being said, the features we compare across these two data sets are things that are agnostic to the modality, which for example are things like how often these bursts of activity occurs. In the time span where the model hasn't seen the EEG data, so before 25 weeks, it predicted really poorly for the organoids. Whereas starting from about 25 weeks, the prediction became a lot more correlated with the actual developmental time of the organoids. Therefore, from the model's perspective, there are similar features in the EEG data from the preterm pre -term babies, which it has seen, compared to the organoid data, which it hasn't. When we use only those features, this model was able to predict what the actual culture age was. Coming back to the organoid as a developmental model, this suggests that um, the network in the organoids are a little bit more complex than we've seen before. So it's able to give rise to activity that you can record with MEA that's similar to features in, for example, preterm infant EEGs. It might suggest that we can use them as models of neural development, for example, or patient-specific models to test out drugs or disease interventions. Many people have been using these multi-electrode arrays to measure the overall network activity, mostly in 2D cultures. Most of the time, these 2D cultures, they generate a level of activity that is below 5 Hz as a mean firing rate and overall uh, brain activity or network activity. Even though you can keep them for longer periods of time, the maturation of those neurons um, reaches a plateau. If you measure a mouse brain slice uh, using the same technology, you get something close to 18 hertz. In a primate brain, um, you get something close to 20 hertz. From our novel protocol for brain organoids, by the end of 40 weeks or about 9 months, the level of activity is getting close to 20 hertz. A level of maturation that's similar to a more intact um, network such as uh, the, uh, the primate brain. Even though these brain organoids recapitulate some of the features that we see on EEGs from preterms and even postnatal human brain, it, it does not recapitulate the entire cortex. It's a model, and as any other models, it has intrinsic limitations, uh, such as the number of cell types. It's not vascularized, 
Um, we don't even know if the culture conditions are the ideal culture conditions, but they are an attractive model to start exploring these early stages of human development. The inability to study the embryonic human brain uh, makes this model even more relevant. There are several conditions, for example, autism, where the genes that are implicated in autism actually are very active in these very early stages of fetal uh, brain development. So next steps on this research would include external stimulation, um, hoping for further maturation of these networks. The other thing that we are also uh, preparing is uh, to connect these uh, brain networks with other brain regions that we can independently generate and, and put them together to see if they start forming small circuitries in a dish. As we improve this model and as the work advances, um, the model is getting more and more complex, perhaps more and more close to the real brain. And um, that might raise some potential concerns about the ethical applications of uh, this tool. Based on what I know of neurobiology and science, I'm pretty sure that what we have now, what anybody working in this field has so far, is very far from anything like self-awareness or sentience. But the plan is to continue pushing further and further, more and more development, more and more structure, and what will that mean? The key here is that the science is extraordinarily exciting and extraordinarily important. I mean, to understand various human neurological diseases is, is crucial because there's a lot of human suffering that goes with that. But just because the goal is so great doesn't mean any means are acceptable. We should be thinking about that and ideally erring on the side of caution rather than pushing too far. No committee is normally going to be looking at what is that thing you're creating when you differentiate those cells into human neurons and allow them to form these networks? We don't have the structure in place yet. And a case could be made that it's the scientific community should not wait for someone else to impose on us rules and regulations and new approaches, but ourselves. Think about what sort of a review process could we develop to make sure we're looking at this step by step. And we should be engaging the general public, both to get their perspectives and also to help them be on board with where it's, where it's going. So we scientists uh, need to be very open to this kind of discussion and always keep in mind that uh, we are using this brain organoids to really help people with neurological conditions, conditions that affect millions of people in the entire world. So having a model to experimentally manipulate uh, the human brain as we do with these organoids um, is instrumental if you want to create better quality of life for these individuals.